All right, take your Bibles with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We'll start reading in verse number 1. Very familiar text uh, if you've been around church for any time. And we ask that you uh, stay with us, though, um, this morning. And if you're there in your Bible, say amen. amen. All right. I'm going to be begin reading in verse number 1. And just follow along with me. I'm going to read several verses. And then uh, I'll pray one more time. And we'll get into the message this morning. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were going away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? And drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go. Call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, and I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto her, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called the Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. We'll stop there. We'll pray, and uh, we'll get into the message this morning. Pray with me. Father, we ask that you would speak now, that you would take over. Lord, I pray you would empty yourself, and you sin that would hinder your spirit from speaking clearly. Lord, I pray that you would... Im- Fill the, the, the hearers with your spirit, Lord, that you, they would receive your word as it is, the perfect word of God. And Father, I pray that we would be challenged today, that we would be encouraged and, and strengthened. Lord, do what only you can with your word. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In John chapter 4, we get this extraordinary account, encounter of Jesus with a woman unnamed at a well in Samaria. And we find a lot about Christ uh, based upon how he operated. And this morning, we're going to see how Jesus, uh, of course, is the hero of her story and the hero of all of our story. You see, once Jesus inserts himself into our life, and we'll see here in this woman's case in her life, everything changes for the better. 
And we're going to get a, a glimpse into this uh, special time in this woman's life, and we're going to see how uh, Jesus made it all happen. I want you to understand this morning, I don't know your story, I don't, I'm getting to know a lot of you, and, but I can tell you if you are saved this morning, if you are in a relationship with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ, Jesus is the hero of your story. It doesn't matter if you come from a background of church and family uh, who love the Lord. It doesn't matter if you come from a different background similar to this woman here of a past of sin and disappointment and hopelessness. Jesus is the reason that we uh, have any hope. And we're going to look at this story this morning. I want you to follow along with me this morning. I want you to notice with me first Jesus' compassion. I want you to see. The Bible says in verse number four, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now, let me tell you, this was not the norm. You see, the Jews, they had no contact with the Samaritans. Samaritans were half Jews who had intermingled and intermarried with the surrounding nations. And, and with that, with those unions, they began to take on the parts of their religions. And so the Orthodox Jew would no way uh, want to go anywhere near Samaria. Matter of fact, the trip from Judea to Galilee, uh, a Jew would take at least 30, 30 miles out of the way to avoid Samaria. It was a big deal. And the Jews had some prejudice in their heart against the Samaritans. And, and uh, this was something that was very prevalent in that society. But we see Jesus breaks the protocol. You see, because Jesus loves the whole world. There's no one in beyond the love of Jesus Christ in here this morning. I don't care what nationality. I don't care what your background is. I don't care your failures. Jesus loves you this morning, and he is not uh, standoffish about it. He loves you with all that he is, and we see his compassion coming forth. He said, I must needs go to Samaria. So he makes this journey to Samaria, and as he gets there, he gets there because he had an appointment with this woman at the well. Now, the Bible says that this woman came to the well, which was in the city of Sychar. And it was at the sixth hour. That meant that it was 12 noon when the sun was the hottest. Now, I want you to understand something about this woman. What this signified was that this woman was an outcast among the Samaritans even. You see, the women in that culture, they would have gone early in the morning to get the water before the hotness of, of the day, before the, the noon sun was beating down on them. You see, these pots were, were very large and they were heavy. And so uh, this was very unusual that she was coming at noon, but yet she came and there Jesus had already sat down and was waiting for her to come. And we see him immediately begin to engage her. Look at verse number seven. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me the drink. Now, isn't it ironic? And it's, Well, actually, there's no irony about it, but uh, Jesus meets her right where she's at. He, she's coming to the well for water, and Jesus asks for water. You see, he's a master soul winner, our Savior. We should learn from him. You see, he, he meets people right where they're at, and he begins with the everyday more, more often than you would think. He, he says, hey, can I have a drink of water? I see you come for uh, the well for some water, and he uh, engages her. And of course, this broke all the tradition, the protocol. He spoke to a Samaritan, and then not only a Samaritan, but a woman. In the Jewish culture, a rabbi would have never spoken to a woman. He would have never had women following him as far as, uh, as a teacher. This was totally against the norm. Jesus always shattered the status quo because Jesus, he's not sexist, he's not racist, and he has no hint of it. He's no respecter of persons. He's the Lord, and he knows everything about everyone, and he loves them the same. Isn't that amazing? And it should be that way amongst his people. There should be no racism. There should be no sexism. There should be women. Most In, in, in Jesus' uh, ministry, he elevated women, and he elevated them, and they were a part of his work. I think about a woman by the name of Mary Magdalene, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, because whenever you see Jesus, you saw Mary Magdalene at his cross. She was one of the, the at the feet, one of the Marys at his tomb. When they put the stone on, the Bible says that she laid it, she was set her back against the a stone of his tomb, and she cried. She loved Jesus, I believe, like none other. And when he resurrected from the grave after three days, 
Guess who was the first person that Jesus went to see? Even before he went to heaven, he met Mary Magdalene, and she didn't recognize him at first, but then he revealed to her who he was, and we know the rest of the story. I want you to know God. He, he looks at the heart. He doesn't look at gender. He doesn't look at socioeconomical uh, success. He looks to the heart who loves him. And so he meets this woman at the well, and he begins to engage her in the everyday. In verse number nine, the woman, she's blown away that he would speak to her. He says, how is it that thou being a Jew, ask, ask it of me, a woman of Samaria, and the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Jesus then makes a transition. Look at verse number 10, from the everyday to the eternal. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So remember, the conversation started with Jesus asking for a drink. And now Jesus is transitioning to the eternal. He says, if you knew who I was, you knew, if you knew the gift of God, and Jesus is God's ultimate gift to man. And he said, he said hey, uh, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me, and I'd give you living water. And, you know, Jesus was masterful in going from the everyday to the eternal. You know, sometimes as believers, we get caught up in the everyday and in the mundane. And, and when we're engaging people or even our family or our children, very little times do we transition from the everyday to the eternal. You see, small talk is good, but sometimes we need to transition to the, the more pressing needs, the most important things. And that's Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what Jesus did so masterfully. He did it effortlessly. And he began to talk to her. He said, hey, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me. And, and he begins to speak and tells her about the living water, which, of course, is a representation of salvation, the Holy Spirit, a living in someone. And look at verse number 11. The woman said unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? So the woman, she's still on the everyday. She's, she quite hasn't caught up to Jesus yet. But we're going to see Jesus patiently bring her along. And then Jesus answers. Uh, she asks him a question. Are you greater than Jacob, uh, the one who gave us this well and drank from it and his children and his cattle? And Jesus explains, once again, the eternal uh, illustration he's giving. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of the water of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. So he, he's saying, hey, the water that I'll give you, the illustration, of course, it will be a well springing that will, you'll never thirst again and it will lead to everlasting life. And he's speaking to her on the eternal. And so now she's intrigued. Now that Jesus has revealed more, she, she wants this water. And then uh, look at verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus begins to delicately point out her need for salvation. You see, I've learned this, guys. People don't get saved until they realize that they're lost. Salvation isn't as appealing until sin and the reality of it is brought to light. And we've got to be careful about this, but it is necessary. Repentance is necessary in salvation. You know, when you're sharing the gospel with your loved ones or someone God allows you to, uh, just, you know, let the, the Spirit lead you. Um, and do it in such a way that you don't offend the person. Well, maybe you'll offend them, but do it in such a way that uh, you love them, that is speaking the truth and love. And we'll see Jesus do it here right now. Look at verse number uh, 15, 16. Jesus said unto her, go, call thy husband and come hither. So Jesus, he knows everything about her. And he says, hey, go call your husband. The woman, she speaks to him. She says, I have no husband. Verse 17. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou saidest thou truly. So Jesus brings up something that wasn't very comfortable, but he does it in a tactful way. And I want you guys to understand something. 
Uh, the gospel is offensive. If you're afraid of offending people, the likelihood of you being used by God is, is, uh, is going to be uh, limited. I'm going to say this. The gospel, <laughs> the gospel is offensive, honestly. The Bible says that it will split homes. It will split, you know, uh, loved one from loved one. But may I say this? I much rather offend someone and, and, and share the good news with them than rather be politically correct or, or be uh, focused on my feelings rather than their eternity. And we see Jesus do this. We see him do it tastefully. You know, I know some Christians who are just, they beat people over the head with the Bible. You know, the Christians, uh, you know, they, we get a bad rap because they go to, uh, you know, gay parades and they hold up the, the, the signs that you're going to hell or, or you know, they picket uh, soldiers' funerals and, and they do things that are, they blow up abortion clinics. And that's not the way that Christians, Bible believers should ever operate. But we should be salt and light in our generation. And when we do have the opportunity to speak to people about their need for a savior, we do not need to gloss over the part of sin. And I know there's some preachers who do not like to use the word sin. Thank God we don't have one of those preachers here. But... <laughs> Uh, but let me say this, people have to know their loss before they understand their need to be saved. And this is what he does. He says, hey, I know you, you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the one you're with now, you're living in an adulterous relationship. And, and I imagine Jesus did it just, just like that. I imagine Jesus didn't say, let me tell you something about you. I know who you are. And I imagine he did it calm, collected, with grace. The Bible says let our speech always be seasoned with grace. Sometimes you have to have difficult conversations, but let it be done in the right spirit. And so this is what Jesus does. He brings out her sin, and I want you to see her response. And this is a lot of people's response, guys. She then becomes religious. She tries to use religion to cover her sin. And let me say this, religion can never pay for sin. See, religion is this. It says man working to get to God. But salvation, Bible salvation is God coming down to man and saving them from their sin. And this is what uh, this woman tried to, she tried to do the other thing, religion. Look at what the Bible says, verse 19. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she gets religious with God. And a lot of people in the last day, they're going to try to get religious with God and say, God, I did this. I was at this church. I got baptized. I did all these things. And he's going to say, sadly, depart from me. I never knew you. But look what Jesus does. Jesus said unto her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So he calls her out. He said, you, you have religion, but you don't even really know God. You, you, you have uh, a place where you worship, but the worship that you're offering, it, it's not the, the true type of worship that God is seeking. And Apart from a relationship with Jesus, we can never worship God. And he begins to break it down more. Verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. You see, uh, a person has to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And how do they come in relationship with God? Through the truth of the word of God. You see, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's no way a person who's unregenerate can worship God. They can't have a relationship with God. And this is the importance of the gospel getting out. And this is what Jesus is sharing with her. And he goes on and he reveals about God. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus just completely puts down the religion. And if you're here this morning and you're holding up your religion or maybe your religious pedigree or maybe the fact that you've been baptized or you're a member of this church and you think that your works or your worship is what's going to save you, may I say to you, it will not hold in the, in the day of judgment. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ 
is the way to heaven, the way to redemption. So Jesus, he, he, he puts down the religion, and then he, the woman responds, and she said unto him, verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. And when he has come, he will tell us all things. So she's on the right track now. And she doesn't, little does she know how close, how right she is. Look at verse 26. Jesus, so she went from religion to a person. Let me tell you this, guys. That's how salvation works. From religion to a relationship with the person of Jesus. And look what takes place. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Boom, mic drop. <laughs> Jesus inserts himself in her story. God himself shows up in her story. I want you to think about the time when God showed up in your story. The day that you trusted him, when you heard the gospel, when someone shared with you, maybe it was at a church, maybe it was your parents, I don't know, maybe it was a friend, maybe at some type of Bible club, but maybe it was, I don't know when it was, but Jesus showed up, he was seeking you, just like he sought out this woman at a well in Samaria where she was an outcast, even among outcasts, but Jesus loved her and he went there for the purpose of seeking and saving her. And may I say today, may we never get over that. Think about the day he showed up in your life. I remember, nine-year-old boy, little nappy head. uh, (laughs) My mother, she's here this morning, she let us go to a a summer camp, a Christian summer camp. It's called the Sky's the Limit. I'll never forget it. In Denver, Colorado. And and, uh, we rode a bus for five days to this camp, and we had a blast and doing things that I had never done before, like, you know, canoeing and, and archery and just so many things and activities, and I had a blast that weekend. But I'll never forget the last day of that camp when the preacher got up and he preached John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when I heard that, I realized I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed Jesus. And that day I trusted him as my personal savior. Little did I know where that would lead, but it was the greatest day of my life. And if you don't have a time, a place, a moment in your life where you can point to where you trusted Christ, and this morning I just wanna urge you, don't leave here without getting that settled. You can sell it. The Bible says that you can know that you have eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The Bible is very clear. It's, it's a decision that we have to make to trust Jesus Christ. And so I want you to see Jesus tells her who he is plainly more than he did to any of the religious leaders of that day. Remember, they would come to him and ask him, who are you? Who are you? How are you, teach, how are you doing these miracles? How are you doing all these things? And he would never say to them, hey, I'm the Messiah. But here to this woman, <laughs> Uh, He says it just very plainly, but I want you to see uh, somewhere between uh, verse 25 and 28, this woman, she gets gloriously saved. She places her faith in Jesus that day, and I want you to see verse 27. The Bible says, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Remember, he was breaking all the rules by talking to this woman in Samaria, but he does those types of things because he's God, And, and so... They're wondering, hey, why is he talking to this woman? What's going on? Here goes Jesus again. He's, he doesn't he not know this is against the rules. And so they are coming back from Subway with all the sandwiches, and, 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 uh, they, and they're just moseying along, you know, how men are. We, we don't always uh, have um, much uh, direction. But he, they come up, and they see him talking to this woman. Verse 28, 28 I want you to see this. The woman then left her water pot. Now, it's a big deal when a woman leaves behind her Tupperware. <laughs> it's a big deal. She, she puts down this water pot and she runs to the city. I want you to just get that for a moment, though. Faith always has a response. Faith in Christ, there's always going to be some fruit. Now, it's, I don't, I'm not... I'm not the expert of how it comes out, but I've seen people who have truly gotten, you know, saved 
and they understand. And usually it's the people who come from checkered backgrounds, you know? You know, they ha- I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes people who grow up in church all their life and they know all the verses and they, they never really got into deep, dark, what we would call deep, dark sin, because sin is sin to God. Let me just be straight with you. Um, they don't quite always relate. And, 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 um, but I've seen drug addicts and, and, you know, people who come from back, you know, bad backgrounds, abuse, all these things. And, and when they get saved, it's like, man, the light comes on. And they're on fire. This is what we see in this woman. Look, she left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men. So she finds the men. Maybe she goes to, the, to that mountain where they meet to, to worship. I don't know where she goes. But she finds the leaders. She goes to the heads. And she says, hey, come see a man. Look, verse 29. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? So she goes into the town, this woman who had a bad reputation, who was living with a man who wasn't her husband, had been married five times, and you would think that her word would not have any weight. But let me tell you something, someone who's filled with the spirit of God, someone who's in relationship with God, you see, God will take those words and he will use them the way that he, only he can. And so he go, she goes into the city and she tells them, and the Bible says in verse number 30, then they went out of the city and came to see him. So can you imagine all these men coming out following this woman and, and uh, they come and they see Jesus and, and immediately uh, I believe Jesus would have begun to engage them. But let me, take a, uh, let me stop for a minute. We have to insert the disciples once again. Let me, let me see what they're doing while all this is taking place. The Bible says in the meanwhile, verse 31, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, master, eat. So they're saying, here, here's your sandwich, uh, Lord, uh, have some food. And, uh, but look at this, verse 32. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore, said the disciples one to another, <laughs> hath, he any, hath any man brought him out to eat? So they're saying, hey, did Jesus order takeout while we were away? Like, What's going on? We just made this long journey. You know, we're all starving. We're waiting for him to bless the food so we can eat. Uh, we don't, you know, have you ever been to a party where everybody's, you know, waiting for the first person to eat? Uh, probably something similar to that, uh, him being the leader. And so they're like, come on, eat. let's eat, let's eat. And uh, they're thinking about their physical. But Jesus says, I have meat that you know. Look, look at it. Jesus said unto them, um, verse 34, Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. You see, Jesus, he had satisfaction outside of the physical. He found satisfaction in doing the will of God. Let me tell you this, guys. When we seek first God and his kingdom and his righteousness and his ways, there is a satisfaction there that can be found nowhere else for the child of God. I promise you guys, I, I, like I said, for the last several months, I've worked in Beverly Hills, and I've seen people with lots and lots of money, with no peace, no joy. And a lot of times, we as believers, we buy the devil's lie that objects and relationships, like this woman at the well, she had many relationships, but still she was not fulfilled. She went from relationship to relationship. But we see when she met Christ, when she began to serve and work for him, she got to see God use her in a way that was far more satisfying than anything that this earth can, can bring. And Jesus was trying to teach this lesson to his disciples. I have meat that you know not of. They had not yet gotten it. And so he says to them, hey, uh, my, my meat or my satisfaction, my substance is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And he goes on, he says, say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. He says to them, they would have understood this very well, being an agricultural society. He says, hey, the harvest is ready. It's white already. It's plenteous. There are people who will come and be saved, but I just need laborers, and I need you to look on, look on the harvest. And I, I imagine at that time, as men were coming, out because that woman had went into town unlike the disciples. They went into town just to get the meat, to get the sandwiches, but they didn't say, hey, they didn't didn't bring that one person back with them to say, hey, come 
out here and meet our Messiah. Come out here and meet the one who saved us. They were a focus on self. And I find that very telling to where they're at. And I find it very uh, an indictment upon me and many of us in this church today because there are days that go by. There are weeks that go by where we aren't trying to bring people to Jesus. That's why we're not satisfied. That's why we don't have lasting joy. That's why we, we're going from thing to thing and entertainment to entertainment and, and, and trying to fulfill our days with all this white noise. But may I say this, the greatest and most satisfying days of your life and my life are when we're serving Jesus. Amen. It's not always easy, but it's fulfilling. Amen. This woman, she got it. The disciples had not yet gotten it. So Jesus had to take a moment and teach them. He goes on, verse 36, and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. There's fruit for life. There's fruit in heaven. Y'all understand that you either lay up treasures on earth or in heaven. And the Bible says that when we lay up treasures in heaven, there's no thieves, there's no, there's no rust, there's no moth. It won't deteriorate. It's for eternity. But if we live for the here and now and and what we have in our 401ks and our retirements, and we live for, to be comfortable, and we, we don't ever get outside of our comfort zone uh, to serve Jesus and to sacrificially uh, bless others, and, and we're missing out. And so Jesus says to them, hey, there's, there's, there's fruit unto life eternal, and both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye entered into their labor. So he's explaining to them, hey, you guys, are, you guys are getting to be a part of the labor of men and women before you. You didn't put any work into this, but I'm, I've gathered you to me, and I've, I'm, I want you to be a part of this. And you have a unique opportunity to, to reap what many have sown with their blood. I think about John the Baptist who uh, would give his life, the forerunner of Jesus Christ who preached repentance and, and, and made the scene uh, ready for Jesus to come along. In the Bible, we saw in the first verse that there were more disciples now following Jesus than were John. And, and now these men were entering into the labors of the prophets and others in the, in the Old Testament and, and throughout uh, these ages. And they had a unique opportunity to reap. And let me say, we live in a unique opportunity. We are in the church age, the age of grace, uh, that before the return of Christ, when Jesus, his gospel is to go to all the ends of the world. That means your neighborhood, my neighborhood, your workplace, your circle of influence. We have a unique space. And let me tell you guys, don't believe it that people don't, don't want to know the truth, that people won't respond if they Find out who Jesus truly is from a spirit-filled believer. I, I promise you, people are hungering, hungry for the truth today. And so he says, hey, you have an opportunity to be a part of my kingdom, my work. But I want you to see this woman, she, she, uh, she understood and she had told all who would listen. And I want you to see what God did. Look at verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. Many. For this, why? Why? For the saying of the woman. God used her in a miraculous way. Which testified, he told me all that ever I did. God used this little woman who was still in an adulterous relationship, who had five husbands, who would be the least likely of candidates to be used of God. And that's how he receives glory. Some of us, we think that because we aren't qualified that God won't use us. No, he's looking for the unqualified. He's looking for those who he will receive glory. You know, Paul was a man who I think many churches today would not have let him preach because uh, he, was, he was straight to the point a lot of times. He had a loving heart, but do but you know what he said? He said, I believe it was in 1 Corinthians. He said, not many noble, not many wise, not many great are, are called. You know, we, we tend to think that if, oh, if LeBron James got saved and, <laughs> you know, 
you know, with his platform and with his resources, yo, man, so many people would come. Nah. I'm telling you guys, God uses the insignificant. He uses the low. And I'm not, I know that's me. And I'm not saying that's you, but I am saying that's you. <laughs> None of us come from, I mean, I'm just being honest. <laughs> it's the Bible, right? See, you're not preaching now. You, you're meddling. <laughs> but hey, I'm just saying God wants to use you this morning. He wants to use you right where you're at. He wants to be the hero. He wants to get all the glory. He's the only one to do the glory, and he, he wants to use you. He just wants you, us to be available. And that's where we're at. That's where we make the decision. You see, a lot of Christians just aren't available. They have their life planned up, planned. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. I'm going to retire by this age. I'm going to do, you know, just, just no, I, no seeking first the kingdom. And that's where we get in trouble. That's where we find the emptiness of even success. And so many believed on Jesus. And so they, verse 40, they, they besought him, the Bible says, that he would tarry with them. He would stay there and he abode two more days. And the Bible says, verse 41, and many more believed because of his own word. And they said to the woman, see, they knew where it all started, though. They knew who God used to get this. They went back to the woman, the ones who got saved during the two days after hearing Jesus. Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Many more believe. Just a few years later, we find God sending another preacher there by the name of Philip, and he held a revival there, and many more Samaritans. You see, this woman was the first fruits of many in Samaria. Remember when Jesus gave the commission, he said, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he says to go into Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And if you see how the gospel uh, propagated from the early church, it went just in that order. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. This is all part of God's plan, and God used her. And may I say this, guys? I hope this encourages you because God wants to use you. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what you don't know. All this woman said to them is, hey, come see somebody. Come see a man. <laughs> come see. Come. Come. I don't, I don't know how to explain it all, but I come see. And we've got to get that fire lit back in us where we say, hey, guys, come. I just got to share with you about Jesus. I just want to tell you what he's done in my life. See, he's changed my life. He, you know, that's what we got. That's the baseline of Christianity. Her priorities changed that day. She, she went to the, 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 the well for water. She left her water pot. She went into town because she had news that needed to be shared. It was urgent news, and God used that. The disciples weren't quite understanding that yet, but Jesus taught them. He, he, he uh, took the moment to, as a teaching moment so that they could be reminded, hey, the harvest is white already. It's ready. That word white, what it means is it was overripe. It was ready. And guys, let me say, our, our culture, our, our country, we're, we're at a crossroads. And a lot of people, I believe, in the days ahead are going to be more open to the gospel than maybe in decades prior. Let us be ready. Like this woman, once she, once she came into a relationship with Jesus, let us be ready to be a witness. And let us tell them of our Savior, the hero of all of our stories.